Hello, and welcome to the Early American Brass Band Podcast. I'm Chris Triano, joined always by Stephen Canastrisi. Hello. This is episode 33, and today we are interviewing Dr. Nathan Miller. Dr. Miller is the assistant professor at Asbury University in Kentucky. He currently plays with Highbridge Brass and also plays with the Lexington Brass Band and Saxton's Cornet Band. We're really excited to have this conversation with Dr. Miller for all of you out there. We talk extensively about the Salvation Army Brass Band tradition and how that influences the overall brass tradition here in America. So we're really excited to share this discussion with all of you. Yeah, it was definitely a refreshing conversation and, you know, just yeah, kind of throughout reiterated a lot of the like bigger uh, points that we try and make uh, on the show about uh, the importance of brass band tradition and that the British brass band tradition is not necessarily the only brass band tradition out there. So uh, we, we talked pretty extensively about that because of how the Salvation Army uh, brass band tradition is, you know, c- kind of how that spread. And you'll hear more about that. He is much more qualified than I am to <laughs> talk about <laughs> it. So we'll save that for the, the episode proper. Uh, but if you like what you're hearing, you can support us on uh, Patreon. We also have some merch up on Teespring. We're up on all the social media platforms, as well as YouTube, where we post uh, some extra content, stuff that doesn't make it into the full episodes. Uh, and if you uh, are curious about anything you hear in any of the episodes, we always have show notes up on our website. That's eabbpodcast.com. So you can go check all that stuff out uh, for any further inquiries or information that you might need. Without further ado, here is our interview with Dr. Nathan Miller. Thank you so much to Dr. Nathan Miller for coming on to the Early American Brass Band Podcast. We're really excited to have you on. I know we've been chatting for a few months now, kind of on and off, and and are really excited that we're finally able to get this discussion off the ground. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Big fan of the pod. (laughs) Thank you, thank you. (laughs) Cool, cool. So... As you may know, at the beginning of each interview, we like to kind of go more or less chronologically through how you got to where you are today, maybe a little bit of your musical background, and then we can get going into some of the the bandier things. (laughs) Yeah, I'll try to, I have a tendency to be long-winded, so I'll try to be direct. (laughs) But my my story in music is just really different than most people, um, particularly people that in uh, American brass bands or in the American music scene. So I grew up in the Salvation Army. It was a church that I was a part of, which people are familiar with brass bands will be aware that the Salvation Army uses often uses brass bands in its worship services. So I grew up hearing brass bands. Uh, and the Salvation Army, at least in the area where I grew up in the central part of the country, I really had a, a strong emphasis on the on lay ministry or lay service. So I knew a lot of really great musicians who weren't professional musicians. Uh, and I started playing um, in just the sort of the Salvation Army music system where you just begin, go to, you know, other kids would go to just a Bible study at church, but we'd go and have Bible study and then beginner band practice. And so I, um, my dad played the alto horn. He's actually, it was a really good alto horn player. Um, and as a seven-year-old, I wanted nothing more than to be just like my dad. So as people thought I was tone deaf because when I would sing, he has a low voice. I would always try to sing every note as low as possible. So the church <laughs> kids choir directors, they all thought I was tone deaf. So I'd get the little finger cymbal solos, but I was just trying to sing every note as low as possible because I just wanted to be like my dad. Uh, so when I went to beginner band, they would start everyone on cornet and I just refused. I'm like, I'm an alto horn player. So I'm, I think the only person I've met who's like, was just insistent about being an alto horn player from the time they were young. Yes. Uh, so I did that, a real like providential moment in my life came. My parents were, as Salvation Army officers were transferred to start a new Salvation Army in the suburbs of Chicago in Des Plaines, Illinois. Hmm. Um, and a young uh, trumpet player in the Chicago Symphony who was a Salvationist had just moved to the area and had agreed to come and start help plant that new Salvation Army church. And that was Mark Reidenauer. Uh, So I had this really great experience growing up from the time I was 10 until I was 16 of just getting to interact with Mark a lot. Um, And he would direct the band and he led our youth band. Uh, And so I had this, we just got to hear him play. So he's the assistant principal trumpet of the Chicago Symphony. Um, And I never had lessons, but I sat next to this uh, middle-aged man like a, that I looked up to. So I was just a little kid sitting in a band next to this older guy who was good. He played in the Chicago staff band and wasn't just he never wasn't a music student or never played professionally, but he was just a bandsman. And he just if I made a mistake, he handed me a pencil. And if I like 
he'd be like, you need to play that E open. You need to play that E with your third valve. And you just like these sorts of advice that you get that like, you know, this is the way that people in early American brass bands would have played. Like just you're kind of learning on the job. And I sat right where Mark would play and conduct and he would just play right into my face. And then he would just give me advice every once in a while. And it's almost like a perfect sort of pedagogic situation for a kid where it's like one month Mark might say to me, Nathan, you've got to put air behind your tongue when you when you articulate. I'm like, oh, okay. So I just spend a couple months trying to do that. And he'd be like, mm -hmm. you're playing with cold air and you need to play with warm air. Mm -hmm. like, oh, like just sort of concepts that I could get. So that was really helpful. Um, and I had no desire to do anything in music, but like I recognized that I liked it and it was good. And it, my parents wouldn't make me do homework if I was practicing the alto horn. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, and we had this really cool, uh, the house that we had, the, there's a, the whole wall in my bedroom for, I don't know for how long, had been decoupaged in song sheets, like just big <laughs> from the 1920s. Okay. So I would just sit there and play melodies so that my mom wouldn't make me do math. Um, <laughs> there you go. And then That's when awesome. we, my parents got transferred when I was 16 to St. Louis and the Salvation Army was a, there were fewer Salvation Armies in St. Louis than in Chicago. Um, and so uh, our church didn't have a, a band. And so I started the band as a 16 year old. Uh, and then the St. Louis Brass Band had this, uh, they had two alto horn players get sick and they're, you know, they, the, the nature of brass bands in America is generally you're converting a cornet player or horn player to play the alto horn. And so they called me up because they'd heard that I was there and that I was good. Um, and they, they had two players sick and it was the day of a concert. So there's no time for anybody else to learn. So I went and played and then they invited me to come back and keep playing solo horn nice. with them. So it was a pretty good band that competed in the second to top level of NAB at the time, I think it was the championship level. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had this like really great experience in like playing with people who had been music majors. And one of the guys just wanted to learn more about um the salvation army and about the alto horn who's a his name was bill hammond he was the horn teacher at washington university in st louis played with you know subbed with the symphony he was a really excellent teacher and so he's like well i assume you want to play the french horn or i assume you also play the french horn he's like i'd love to give you free french horn lessons if you'll just play some alto horn with me and tell me more about the salvation army and so i just was making friendly conversation and said well sure i'll do it <laughs> um, but i don't have a french horn i've never played the, i only played the french horn just a little bit in school i would generally in school would play the saxophone part and trans just play on the alto horn gotcha yeah. um and so i uh i'm like well if i want to get a french horn what i want to get and he kind of just said in passing well if you see a con 8d for under 2000 you should you should get it uh and then literally the next day i was presented with an opportunity to buy a con 8d for 1800 dollars, and i had 1850 dollars in my bank account that I had saved up because I played my dad's alto horn. So when I was going to go to college, I was going to need to buy my own alto horn. So I was saving up to buy a Besson Sovereign. And I was like, well, I guess. And in my mind, I'm like, this is God telling me I'm going to be a French horn player. <laughs> so I spent all the money I'd ever made mowing lawns. And I bought that French horn. And I decided then that I was going to have to go to Asbury College because Asbury had a brass band with a full set of brass band instruments. Nice. Mm. Like, well, I guess that's what I have to do then. That's where... <laughs> That's where I'll go. And that's where Mark Ridenauer had gone. So it seemed like a logical choice for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that day I decided I was gonna become a, a real musician. And I essentially spent, like once I got to college, I spent you know, five to seven years like trying to forget everything I knew about the alto horn. Oh. <laughs> like, I tried to pursue, as, a, as we are when we were young, I'm like, oh, I feel like I'm gonna be a French horn player. So I must be the best French horn player in the world. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that was the only, seemed like the only option to me. Mm -hmm. So I just went on this, like just followed it, like just, practice all of my free time like to the point of unhealthiness for my lip and my face <laughs> and everything i just was going to do it but i got into ccm that's where i met hiram who you guys know Hiram diaz and the u.s marine uh, the marine band uh mm -hmm. and i just, just kept pursuing playing french horn uh, afterwards i was you know started freelancing and taking auditions and having progressively more progressively less success depending on you know the month and just that sort <laughs> of uh, beat your brains in uh um auditioning scene you know where you're like yeah. how do they want me to play um and all the while as i was doing this i was like having friends who are playing in brass bands and i had friends some friends who played in the new york staff band of the salvation army it's a really great group and they'd be like oh man joe alessi came in and played with us today and they'd be playing these things that are super fun and i'd be like i am playing you know community college musical and mm -hmm. i'm playing a wedding and i'm getting ready to audition and it just felt kind of dead to me 
Mm-hmm. So I kind of decided I wasn't going to do that freelance thing. So I took a job leading the music of the Salvation Army in in Central Kentucky. Uh, it gave me a lot of time to practice. Um, and so I kept auditioning, but started thinking about other things. Um, mm-hmm. And when I got down here, I started having some more success playing. But around this area in Lexington, where Asbury is, where I teach at Asbury University, which is also where I went to school, mm-hmm. uh, there's just a lot of brass bands and a lot of brass band things. So mm-hmm. I was playing in the Lexington brass band. And then I, like pretty quickly, they had me playing the Saxton's cornet band and we were getting professional opportunities there. In Lexington, mm-hmm. the French horn scene is just kind of like an, an old boys club, like really great old boys and wonderful people who I love. But there just mm-hmm. weren't opportunities for me. There just weren't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I wasn't getting those. But I was getting all of these alto horn opportunities. Nice. And it's just weird how that kind of functioned for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just like everything just kind of started turning up alto horn. Eventually, I was a finalist of the West Point Band, and I hurt my lip in the sort of lead up into that audition mm-hmm. process. Mm-hmm. And I had a really great – for me, I'd worked so hard for this thing, and I had a great moment talking to their principal after the audition. And I was uh, – he's like, man – He's like, your DVD, your audition DVD sounded great. He's like, you're going to get a job. You're definitely going to get a job here soon. And I was like, done. That's all I needed. (laughs) I'm like, I felt like it was enough justification to me. Like I knew that I could do it. I'd worked hard. I'm like, I don't want this life. Like that's not the life I want. Like as I enjoy playing out the horn, I was loving conducting and I was getting more interested in scholarship. So I started pursuing a, a PhD in musicology and so I did uh, my PhD on uh, Salvation Army brass bands in the United States, 1880 to 1919. Um, and along the way, they've taken an interest in early American brass bands. Um, so that's where it really kind of started narrowing. And then I started getting more professional opportunities with um, playing the alto horn and kind of doing this, which kind of culminated in the formation of High Bridge Brass with Mark Ridenauer, Hiram Diaz, kind of two people from different points in my life as well as Chris Martin and uh, Chris Tiedman from the Marine band. Yeah. yeah. So it was like, nice. I ended up in this weird place where I get these really amazing opportunities to play with the best brass players in the world. And I get to play alto horn. I'm like, Oh, it's like, how'd this happen? Yeah, that, <clears throat> pretty ideal for sure. <laughs> yeah. And like, as a, as a, so I'm a Christian kind of the most profound thing or most important thing in my life. And so I see this as kind of God's hand having guided me. And even like you could, I couldn't study alto horn, and I loved it from the time I was seven, eight years old. I mean, I've loved the alto mm-hmm. horn, but that was not an option mm-hmm. to yeah. study that in America or to pursue that. But through playing the French horn, playing the uh, horn, you know, I got to study at a great university and like get high level experiences. You know, and the, the sort of the pursuit is as mind numbing and soul sucking as the audition process can sometimes be. Yeah. Like it teaches, it taught me a rigor and a discipline and a focus that just, I don't know that anything else could have taught me. I, yeah. I credit a lot of the other success I've had in my life and other avenues as well with just that rigor. Yeah, you know, like that mm-hmm. It wasn't beneficial. Like I never got that job, which along the way I kind of realized I didn't want, but um the benefit of that approach and that just that discipline just really worked wonders in my life (laughs) yeah yeah definitely and i'm sure once you kind of had that that moment of uh accomplishing kind of what you wanted to in the professional audition it's just a a sense of relief you know and a and a liberating feeling at the same time yes sometimes i mean i mean this is the story for most people who pursue music is Mm -hmm. the professional job is not there Mm -hmm. you know what i mean it's like It's just, that's not, that's not what lies at the end of the journey. And sometimes a lot of my friends have been really jaded by that experience and they kind of Mm -hmm. come out of it and they're like, what was all this work for? And my experience was just really different. I I did have this, this moment where, you know, someone said you did it. And I felt like I I worked hard enough, but like somehow I didn't, I needed something. I needed an out that let me say, I don't want to do this, but I'm not giving up somehow. Or I didn't just... Mm-hmm. not make the most of my opportunity. So that was a real blessing in my life, that, like, him saying that. It could have been all a lie or just in passing. <laughs> but it was nice. He was just like, man, you're definitely going to win a job soon. He's like, if you didn't edit your tape, you're going to win a job soon. I'm like, done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm out. <laughs> right. That's awesome. I'm out of it. So anyway, that was good. So I, I have a, a ton of like little tiny like kind of follow-up questions, but I think the best way of maybe addressing all of those is just by kind of 
diving in and asking the main question, can you give us a little bit more of a, a background on the Salvation Army and kind of its music tradition? And then maybe we can we can do some follow ups from there instead of me just asking like 30 <laughs> tiny <Yeah>. questions. <laughs> so the, uh, the Salvation Army is such an interesting thing to study and to look at uh, because it's so present. Like everyone has heard of it, you know, like you can't watch a sitcom where someone doesn't joke about someone's clothes belonging at the Salvation Army. Mm. You know, it's just it's hyper present in people's lives. The largest charity in the country and for musicians is even present. But uh, it's so common and commonplace, but so othered that people don't think about it. Like no history of American music accounts for the Salvation Army. Mm -hmm. Mm. Gives even a side note. So not any of those sort of like full collections, Richard Crawford's. Uh, music in America, which is probably the best of all of them. Like mm -hmm. they, it's not even mentioned as a side note and it's like a tiny thing, but it's this huge, huge endeavor um, that when you like, when, when you start describing it to people, they're like, Oh my, Oh my goodness. I can't believe that's there. And we didn't, we didn't know it. So yeah, the Salvation right. Army uh, began 1865 in London by William Booth. And the idea was that people on the margins of society, the poor, the destitute, didn't have a place in church and the the gospel wasn't being brought to them. Um, and this at a time like, you know, the, the Victorian age is coming to a close and industrialism, like we just have, um, what they would describe as the sub submerged 10th, like these 10% of people that are just outside the margins of British society. Hmm. Uh, so it just starts creating a mission society that's re reaching out to the poor. And it's not called the Salvation Army in its origins. And about 15 years later in 1878, they come up with this idea of the Salvation Army. And militarism is just the dominant and most important um, theme in the life of young men and of men, right? Like this is the age of imperialism. You have the, like everyone's in the, the military. You just before this in England had the, what they called the volunteer movement, where it's kind of like national guards to us. And just like, mm -hmm. You have the all sorts of things that are just organized in this militant structure. In America, this is right after the Civil War, like which is like I people saw in this idealized way, you know, on both sides mm. um, to avoid both sides or ism. Mm. Um, but you have this like the, this I, becoming the Salvation Army played a huge role in this. So here's just like this working class movement, and they're adopting these military metaphors. And so at that point, brass bands kind of became almost the an inevitable connection in British life, mm -hmm. which the Salvation Army was quasi-military and brass bands are not really military in England, but they're like this sort of quasi-military movement that further was like connected to the working class, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like working class music that's quasi-military just belonged in the Salvation Army. So the short mm -hmm. story is there is then brass bands begin being used in the Salvation Army and a whole tradition emerges. Um, and the Salvation Army really wanted their music at that time to be separate and kind of in the world but not of the world so it's kind of similar to some other brass band traditions it's not really it's similar to others but it's on its own so i grew up and at larger salvation armies you'd have a brass band and sometimes these can be 50 or 60 people oh, wow. in a brass mm -hmm. band and there's just like this highly developed music just thousands and thousands of pieces organized into journals accessible uh and a whole just tradition and alongside of that is a music education system that accompanies it mm -hmm. so like when you're at seven or eight, you go into beginning band, you go once a week, you learn theory. In the summers, you go to a summer camp or a music conservatory. Like, so mm -hmm. I was taking theory and composition lessons. I was in choir. I was having band classes and sectional classes on my alto horn. Mm -hmm. So you're just like thrown into the system, which is also intergenerational. So like kids are sitting next to adults. Um, and this has produced a lot of really excellent musicians. Like Phil Smith, mm -hmm. you know, Mark Reidenauer, um, uh, Phil Catlin A in the Low Brass World was a Salvationist. The Vaughn Williams mm -hmm. Tuba Concerto was written for him. Why was it that that brass music was adopted as that main kind of voice through the Salvation and Army and not either like uh, choir music or string instruments or, or mixed instrumentation? Yeah, two reasons primarily. One is the Salvation Army held most of its meetings outdoors. So brass instruments were ideal for outdoors. And two is it's again, it's connection to the working class. The mm -hmm. Salvation Army was a working class church so this was like music that doubled down on that image. Gotcha. And and those are the primary reasons. And there were attempts to, like when they started having more services inside, mm -hmm. there was an attempt to kind of start strings. But at that point, it was just, we did brass bands. Gotcha, mm -hmm. gotcha. And then uh, saying that it started in London, I'm assuming then from there, it 
kind of was shared with the rest of the world does did that brass band tradition go with what the salvation army already was or when it came to the united states it coincidentally kind of incorporated brass bands also it's both and so this is like a misnomer. It's, it's one thing i really appreciate about y'all's website existing is there's this misnomer that brass bands are british but brass bands are just not british like they're mm -hmm. all over the world right like you have yeah. indian brass bands and eastern european brass bands and you have brass bands in africa and you've got like the american brass band movement is not particularly connected to or dependent on the british brass band tradition in a lot of ways it's a whole lot more connected to italians and germans than it is to the yeah, british true. traditions right. and it's just like this misnomer because we know about the british brass band and so it's like kind of a pet peeve of mine that everyone's like oh british brass bands it's like no like certainly <laughs> certainly in britain has had the greatest flourishing, the greatest activity. It's been the most vibrant and dynamic and long lasting and most like largest, of course. But mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, it's kind of a both and experience. So the Salvation Army arrives in America around 1880. Um, and brass bands, as y'all will know at this point, are beginning the decline, beginning to permeate, uh, to evolve into the American wind band through the influence mm -hmm. of Gil Gilmore and Sousa and everyone in it to follow them. And my master's degree, which is a performance degree, I did a paper I did for my research and writing class. Mm. My paper had a great title. It was uh, Sousa on Trial, Implicating the March of the March King and the Death of Brass Bands in 20th Century. <laughs> there you go. That's awesome. Yeah. That's a great one. I'm like, I was not a musicologist at this point. I'm like, a paper is all about a title. Yeah, that's um, a great title. I like that. Yeah. And it's not really <laughs> entirely true. Like, Sousa didn't do that. But people emulated Sousa and the, the, the mm. brass band disappears. So this is what my dissertation is about, and I will try to not go into dissertation um, <laughs> ramble. But so when the Salvation Army comes to America, brass bands are are leaving. They're still there. They're still present, like, but they're decreasing in number and they're decreasing in prominence. Um, but there's some really different things about American context for brass bands and a British context for brass bands, where in Britain it's working class music of working people. Wealthy people are playing in orchestras. We don't really have orchestras in America. They're only just beginning. Right. There's like all of this sort of state and aristocracy sponsored music in Europe, which we don't have in America. Like the American brass band is like a music for all of America. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like yeah, working class people, but also wealthy people. I mean, you can just find countless things of people like of the wealthy going to these brass band concerts and gardens and different places. Like it is just right. American music further because of it's a connection to the civil war and like this, the highly religious nature of how people thought of the civil war in nostalgia, like brass bands are just connected to that intrinsically. Mm -hmm. The camp meeting movement among Methodists, there's lots of brass bands playing in Methodist camp meetings all over the place. Mm -hmm. So people have a different perspective of brass bands in America. So when the Salvation Army comes over, people hated them because they're working with mm -hmm. poor people, like they're women in ministry, um, they are integrating the races, it's like, uh, these are hitting a few sticky points for American Christians. So right, we're man. not so happy about that. And the Salvation Army is like incorporating uh, minstrelsy, not blackface, but the, the music of minstrelsy and the music of the of Tin Pan Alley. Like, and they're just singing songs, changing the words and making it so that people outside a bar could sing along. And mm -hmm. incidentally, they do a similar thing in England. And this is something that people often miss in the brass band movement. And so it's another little pet peeve of mine is uh, Salvation Army brass band music has as much connection to American brass bands and to American music as it does to British brass bands. So early British brass bands, it's this Victorian sense of like the mine managers are supporting a band so that these poor mine people can have culture. And once they have culture, then they'll be better. <laughs> and so they're playing early British brass bands are playing transcriptions of Handel and Haydn and Beethoven. And Salvation Army brass bands are playing Tin Pan Alley songs and music from the American. There's this, this revivalism that moves like with Dwight L. Moody and others goes over to England. And that music is really influenced by the Civil War. So early Amer Salvation Army marches sound a whole lot more like American quick steps than they do <laughs> British band marches because of this connection to American music and working class, like working class music of urban England, which again is all this minstrelsy. So there's a lot more syncopation and the sort of like of those influences was there ever a time with the salvation army's repertoire when they were purely playing uh like worship music and like kind of bringing in the secular music was uh like an like an issue or an evolution or were was it they, were they always open to both kind of realms Eager and aggressive about taking secular music so william booth would just like so every church ever has had that they've someone's ascribed this statement to 
why should the devil have all the good music? People say Wesley said that. People say Luther said that. People say everyone said that. But it's not attributable to anyone. But William mm. Booth, the founder of Salvation Army, did say he, he wanted to take the, the the cultural, the music of the devil, like the gun, everyone's military metaphor before. The music of the devil was an armament. He wanted to take that armament and turn it and use it against the devil. So mm. they would take the songs from the bar. So famously, Champagne Charlie was his name, became Bless His Name, He Sets Me Free. Or here's the good old whiskey, drink it down, drink it down, came, became storm the forts of darkness, bring them, uh, bring them down, bring them down. And so every music in the Salvation Army had to have a sacred lyrics attached to it that largely Salvation Army composers composed. So there's like American gospel song, like hymnody of the church, plus bar songs and minstrel songs with new words that were mm-hmm. almost always very militant. Interesting. Very like sort of Christian militant, um, right. but not in the sense of like imperialism in the sense of they saw themselves, and this is another point for my dissertation, they saw themselves as their own nation and they were trying to conquer England and they wanted to conquer America hmm. and they wanted to conquer Africa, but not in the same way that you have from some of the hymnody of England at the time, like from Greenland's icy mountains when they're trying to like travel around the world and take British culture everywhere with them. So it's kind of different. Hmm. But brass gotcha, bands, gotcha. they take them all around the world. But in America, the brass bands don't succeed at first because hmm. that's a respectable thing to do. But it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. But as the Salvation Army started using brass bands, society started liking them more. Whether or not which came first is hard to dissect. But when people hmm. hear the Salvation Army brass band in the 1890s, in the 1900s, like they're thinking back to the Civil War and they're thinking... Hmm of this they're also thinking of people like Sousa like here are these milit these uniformed people playing instruments and Sousa is described in the 1890s as the ideal man so people start seeing the Salvation Army's work as being good for society and they kind of see that in the music as well and yeah, the, the music true. begins to develop more I mean the stories of early Salvation Army bands are horrendous like Dwight's music journal will describe some of them and then be like this is the worst thing that has ever existed and there's just <laughs> stories of like someone getting saved and converted to the gospel in a bar one night and they give them a cornet and they say you're on duty tomorrow night so these <laughs> bands were just like had to be the worst but they quickly became better they had higher professional musicians in town so in dansbury dan dansbury connecticut they hired george ives to teach them to play and charles ives has a lot of connection with the salvation army his first published piece a string quartet called on the salvation army his famous song general william booth enters heaven so he has a lot of interactions with the salvation army and they become present I mean, these salvation army bands played every night of the week on the, the busiest street corners in town yeah. and they'd play eight times on the weekends so these bands yeah. were just everywhere all of the time yeah, and if you look at right. oral histories of new york in the early turn of the 20th century npr did an oral history of new york at, or at 1900 and the first thing they played is a salvation army band people described them everywhere mm. yeah. but we just have looked past them in, in as far as music history goes we just don't think about it it's just mm-hmm. floating beneath the surface yeah, right. yeah. people talk yeah. about brass bands being new in america or that brass bands died in America. There are like hundreds and thousands of Salvation Army brass bands across the country. Yeah, that's been a that consistent the thread the whole time through. Yeah. 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 So I bristle when people are like British brass bands. I'm like, no, the long <laughs> history of American brass bands. We've been playing it like it didn't just die. And these are early American brass bands would play music from the early American brass bands. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They would play yeah. music that are published by for brass bands for Methodist camp meetings, you know, before they start having more access to the music being published in England. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Good point. It's, um, I'm curious with the, the band uh, with the tradition of the brass bands being affiliated with the Salvation Army originating in London and kind of it being there. And I know we talked about it evolving kind of separately in the U S but you kept on referring to as the instrument you play as alto horn. <laughs> so yes. the, the, how, how did they, some of those, uh, instrument classifications or whatever for, alto and tenor specifically kind of work in the, within the Salvation Army. So we're going like, to hopefully our British friends aren't listening to this because they're going to be. <laughs> um, we call it an alto horn because it's always been called an alto horn. It's called an alto horn in the early American brass bands. They're called the altos, right? Mm-hmm. Tenors are played mm-hmm. like what we think about tenors, baritones, we're like euphoniums. Like when Adolf Sachs invented it, he called it the alto horn or the alto horn, right? Like mm-hmm. yeah. in Sweden, they call it the alto horn, alto horn. In Germany, it's called the alto horn. Right in France, yeah. like everywhere it's called the alto horn, and I have some theories about why. Like even the, if you go to the earliest British catalogs for sax horns, mm-hmm. like they describe them as alto horns. Hmm. But my theory is this: in 
uh, in the it's a hyper masculine culture in British brass band British brass banding, like just mm -hmm. hyper masculine. My theory, and this is not based on research, is that some guys just didn't like to be called a girl's instrument name. Like alto sounded feminine. That's mm -hmm. my theory. Yeah, yeah, but really interesting. It plays in the alto range. Like maybe the second horn plays plays the tenor part. But if you had to p take brass conical brass instruments and arrange a hymn for them, what parts the alto? What parts the alto tenor horn playing? Yeah, exactly. That. It's not playing the tenor yeah. part. Yeah, yeah, right. And then this is a pep, this is so in the Salvation Army in America we've always called it the alto horn, which is very similar to the American brass band tradition. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's just pet peeve. It's like the last fifteen years people have decided we had like when brass band started in america like the naba revival and they come back we call it the alto horn and it's called it's called the alto horn forever in the last 15 years we've decided oh this is embarrassing because our friends across the sea called the tenor horn then we must call it the tenor horn Yikes. right and right. so this like so i grew up in the alto since, since 1989 1990 i've been playing the alto horn and now all of a sudden people want to correct me when I say alto. They're like, oh, you mean the tenor horn? I'm like, no, I don't mean the tenor horn. That's ridiculous. So, so like, in, the, in the Salvation Army over in Europe, do they call that instrument the tenor horn also? Or within the Salvation Army, is it the alto horn? And then in like the competitive British brass bands, it's tenor? So I want to do some more research on this. So in Salvation Army publishing, it's called solo horn. Has always, from what I can gather, right. always just called solo horn, first mm -hmm. horn, second horn. And I imagine it's because the Salvation Army is an international movement and was publishing music for its international wings. That it was, that I had always thought as a kid, I always thought we called the alto horn the Salvation Army there too, because I never saw a tenor horn on any of my parts. But it wasn't until I was like researching it a little bit. I'm like, I never see alto horn on any of my parts either. It just says solo horn. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so my British friends who play the, the alto horn call it the tenor horn. And I don't, yeah, I don't true. criticize them for it. It's okay. They, that's what they called it there. I'm not telling them they have to change. Mm -hmm. There's all these like uh, <laughs> Anglophiles playing in brass bands in America who start telling me I need to call it the tenor horn. I'm like, so then I have to manage this. I'm like, play the alto. So I always like alto slash tenor horn. But yeah, yeah. Just me up. I'm like, why can't I call it the alto horn? It's what, it's it's like what us saying. We play the euphonium and they're like, oh, you mean the baritone? It's like, yeah, sure. The baritone, whatever. Yeah, but it's different. <laughs> educated people all like agree with you. Where I have the problem where the people you know disagree with me. And I'm like, no. And then I have this, like, you know, the, the researcher or the musicologist been where I'm like, I'm right and you're wrong. No, like, yeah. you think you're smart. You think you know what's up. But I saw, I've seen, you know, Adolf Sachs, you know, model designs and they say alto horn or alto horn, whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. So it's like a reclaiming, reclaiming the, reclaiming the brass band as a, as a living American tradition. Right. We have mm -hmm. a history like that goes back to the early American brass band. We have a continued history, right, through the 20th century. And I would suggest that, like, I, this is something I want to do more research in soon, uh, like the drum and bugle chord traditions are essentially brass bands. Like, yeah. it's an American mm -hmm. expression of brass, of brass bands, which was an international movement, right? Yeah. And like yeah, yeah. all of the marks of all of the marks of drum and bugle corps are the same sorts of things we have of the international movement of, of brass bands. Like what sort of kids are in drum and bugle corps? Wealthy kids from the Hamptons? No. Right? It was working yeah. class families, working mm -hmm. class kids who go to college and learned they learned how to play in the school systems. And they played in their high school marching band. And they go to college, they do the drum and bugle corps, and they have competitions and they travel around. It's like, oh, it starts sounding like we're describing the bra British brass band, right? <laughs> it's like really pretty similar like yeah and yeah, then yeah. we have this like a return of like the sort of like more like of the sort of concert brass bands in the 1970 late 1970s and into the 1980s and which mm -hmm. is really flourishing now just drives me crazy that people act like it hasn't that it hasn't been something here before like yeah yeah we have a history and that's why i'm so grateful for you guys existing it's like yeah thank you <laughs> we've done this we've yeah. got a replica <laughs> that at all when when you look at a score for a salvation army piece does it would it match a brass band score written for a British brass band? Because I know that you were mentioning before that the number requirements for a Salvation Army brass band aren't restricted to like the competition numbers of British yeah. brass bands. And this is really, this is a, one of the functional reasons why the Salvation Army brass band is maintained is everyone's playing trouble. For some reason it's beneficial to the British brass band system. Anyone can play anything. You just need mm -hmm. four people. And so Salvation Army music is grouped into different journals for different size bands. Um, but in their beginnings, like you, up until the 1970s or 80s, you were not allowed to play in a competing non-Salvation Army brass band and a Salvation Army brass band. Mm -hmm. Like in Salvation Army music was not allowed to be played by outside groups. 
and the Salvation Army was not allowed to play outside music. I mean, everyone did, but they weren't allowed to, right? <laughs> um, and so, like, they were like, there, there's this really clear division. So the Salvation Army music does not traditionally use, like, a Ripieno cornet. So the Salvation Army music... Mm-hmm. Um, in what we would call our general series, which is like the, the series that has existed the long, longest for full bands, would be solo cornet, first cornet, second cornet, soprano, flugelhorn, solo horn, first horn, second horn, euphonium, first baritone, second baritone, first and second trombone, bass trombone, E flat and B flat tuba. So it is the instrumentation of a, of a brass band largely, but uh, mm-hmm. the cornets are divided differently and we don't have third cornet. And then different journals will be for different size bands. Um, okay. And sometimes they'll still use that same terminology, but they'd be like solo and first cornet would play the same part. And then like, mm-hmm. if you go down to even more flexible arrangements, you have like B flat one, E flat one, E flat two, B flat two, and it's like super hyper flexible. Mm-hmm. And if you have four people with an optional fifth part, you can pretty much play all of the things. In recent years, yeah. so in the, I think in the late eighties, they lifted the band on that Salvation Army music being sold outside and Salvation Army bands playing more outside music. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's been more overlap. So some, um, there's a, the sort of the, the series of the hardest music is called the Judge Street Collection, which is based on the, the address in Judge Street where the Salvation Army music offices in London are or were. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the Judge Street Collection often will have competition band scoring and they're thinking gotcha. about marketing that out and kind of, um, a, a website you can link in here that people can look at if they want to get access to this library. The Salvation Army, a great benefit is it's because this military structure is hyper organized. So mm-hmm. it's called SA Music Index. I think it's .com. Let me look it up here really quickly while we're talking. SA Music Index.com. And you can, and most of them have recordings on it, but it's just like a researcher's dream, but it's also very functional. You can order most of the music right online. Nice. And it just has all of it organized with like all of the sort of information. And it's, it's really amazing. Um, mm-hmm. but you can search by series and you'll, you'll see it. It's like, it'll shock you how much is there if you've not seen it before. And again, like you can order it for your brass bands or different things. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Um, mm-hmm. Again, it's really remarkable. Do they, I mean, does the Salvation Army offer any arrangements that like, uh, any historical arrangements that would have been played by brass bands in the 19th century or are things kind of always evolving and that kind of music doesn't survive anymore? No, it survives. Some of it does. There was a, in World War II, during the Blitz, there's a giant fire at the headquarters. So a lot of the earliest things were lost forever. Gotcha. Um, so you could, there are some of them that can be picked up piecemeal. Like one of the discoveries in my just research for my dissertations, I found a, a, a book of the, of the New York staff band from 1904, which contained largely American pieces, which again were forbidden in the Salvation Army. Um, and so they would tack, they'd paste in new words. So if someone asked them, they could be like, no, no, this, this works. And they would paste over the title. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, nice. So if it were uh, um, like, uh, so in there, the Stars and Stripes Forever. So Stars and Stripes is pasted over and it just says Salvation Army March number 25. <laughs> and, you know, take out nice. the soldier name. So there's a fun research project is like, you don't have all the information, but try to like match up these pieces. So I discovered that in which like there's all these sort of research clues in Salvation Army publications. They'd constantly be urging bandmasters to to only play Salvation Army music, mm-hmm. which is the big clue that they weren't playing only Salvation Army music. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> they yeah. needed to be constantly <laughs> reminded, and they'd be like, "This bandmaster talks with the reason of his success is he only plays Salvation Army music." It's like, well, what about all those other groups then? So this was helpful because I could actually paint. Here's exactly kind of what some of these groups were playing. Mm-hmm. So that yeah, was yeah, that's super helpful. That's awesome. Really helpful. Um, but you can you can get some of them online. It's harder. To, like, I mean, you can go back. Let me see. So in the general series, I mean, there's 2,200 general series pieces that have been published. Wow. So I mean, it's just uh, and that's just one series. Um, but the earliest ones are like 1883, and there's some of those you can still get access to depending on if they've found them. Um, the earlier pieces again aren't, aren't they don't get played a ton there's this sort of flowering of salvation army music whereas all of these kids so the earliest salvation army bands are just people who've never played before who are just given instruments and told to play and they were terrible but kids were just playing along hmm. with them so it wasn't a generation later you have these kids growing up who've been playing on the street in front of people every night of the week and eight times hmm. on the weekends and having two or three band practices a week and those kids were really good. And so like you have like mm. Eric Ball and Wilfred Heaton and George Marshall, and you start having like this flowering of Salvation Army composers that kind of come out of this. And they were shepherded the, mm-hmm. by this really great 
Richard Slater is this is the father of Salvation Army music. Um, he was like a, a student of music and he got attracted to the Salvation Army as a violinist and just as someone in the late 19th century played everything. And he kind of shepherded them and started editing the music. And they all kind of, a lot of them came up in this system. And then by the 1920s, the Salvation Army music kind of takes off. So we'll play stuff back to the 1920s. The stuff before that doesn't really get played gotcha, except gotcha. for in a historical context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. makes sense, yeah. makes sense. Yeah. I was wondering a lot of times when we're talking about the 26th North Carolina Regiment Band and the Civil War and kind of talking about the Moravian tradition, a lot of times I kind of compare as just a quick way of being able to kind of explain the Moravian music tradition as comparing it to the Salvation Army in that their brass musical traditions were super uh, connected and important to them. <laughs> Am I completely off base there with, with yeah. making that connection? Yes, or? yes and no. I mean, there's mm. not really any, I've not found any connection between them. Like mm, the Moravians yeah. is a really small movement outside of, mm. you know, 15th century uh moravia um mm -hmm. i guess uh like in the u.s there's just a few places where that flourishes like so you have north carolina pennsylvania mm -hmm. and like it predates valved brass and the sort of the yeah, brass definitely. band movement of among working class people and so i'm not a scholar of moravian music but my experience is like as at least when i've glanced at it it seemed like it's it's not really working class it's like churched people right and there's mm -hmm. like this yeah, long-standing yeah, yeah, church tradition where like, if I'm not mistaken, I think there's a real emphasis on the trombone, like the, so the trombone could do chorales yeah, and huge, play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Like that's really different. So the, the Salvation Army is a working class movement like that comes around when brass bands are flourishing. And so mm -hmm. it's really more connected to that, to the brass band movement, um, plus American gospel song and like popular Tin Pan Alley music. It's just like everything working class. It's like brass mm -hmm. bands mark that, but they yeah, weren't playing sense. early on. They weren't playing Beethoven and Haydn and trying to make themselves better that way. They were like trying to take on these other tunes. Richard yeah, Slater, yeah, I, I, interestingly, was a Wagnerian as well, loved Wagner. He named his daughter Brunhilde. Um, <laughs> so he really pushed for it. And so by the early 20th century, they started allowing transcriptions, but they had to have a text associated with them. Um, yeah, if you go on YouTube, there's a we we do a hybrid brass. We do this arrangement of Shenandoah that Mark has arranged as a as a solo, which is based on a brass band arrangement. It's kind of a multiple layers. It's based on a brass band arrangement by Lynn Ballantyne that he had of of Shenandoah, but there weren't Christian words associated to it. So before the Salvation Army allowed him to publish it, he had to publish words to go along with it. So there's they attached it to this beautiful poem, "Mid All the Traffic." So it's called Mid All the Traffic. And then Mark kind of adjusted that into a solo that he'd play with brass bands. And then we had Chris Larios make it into a quintet arrangement. <laughs> so <laughs> I've had a number of people ask me if they could get access to that arrangement. And I'm like, it's just a copyright. It's just yeah. like a web. I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I got permission for everyone to use it, but I don't know how you, I, I can't sell it to you. And I don't think I can give it to you. Speaking of hybrid brass, you, you mentioned them earlier when you were kind of giving us your, your musical journey there, but maybe we could talk about them specifically for a second. So when exactly did you guys form? Because it's fairly recent. I remember seeing it pop yeah. up on Facebook. Um, so what's what's kind of the backstory there? So, we, uh, so the backstory is um, Hiram and I went to grad school. Well, I was in grad school in Cincinnati while he was an undergrad, and we were friends but not super close uh, our paths crossed when the marine band came to central kentucky and i had him come do something at asbury and like we were just like hey like 
really a, a more meaningful friendship kind of emerged. Anyway, I did a, bra a summer brass camp at Asbury for a few summers. It's really small, like eight to 10 students. And I would have Mark, who is, you know, who was an Asbury alum like I was, who I also, you know, just close family friends with. So I'd have Mark and Hiram and I would teach. And so one of the things we'd do is we really wanted to emphasize playing with the students and playing for the students. Like, I don't think enough people do this. So we would do it each, each time we would do this, we'd take some days where Hiram, Mark and I would just take music and we would just play and we'd let the students sit around us and like watch us turning music and watch us looking at each other and communicating. And like this is how musicians work through and learn music, yeah. like yeah. on a real level. So like just, it's just helped. And that, that's kind of based on my experience as a kid. Like sometimes you just need to sit in and do it. And then we'd all perform with them. We'd play duets with them. We'd do, it's like all the teaching in the world, I think is sometimes pointless. I'm like, just sit next to someone who's good and play with them. Yeah, yeah that's, that's how you get good. better. Mm -hmm. Right. Definitely. Um, and so, uh, so we did that. And so we would play, each year we do this. So I think it was summer of 2017. Um, we were doing this camp. And so we played the Poulenc, I think Poulenc Brass Trio. And we, mm. uh, Hiram just kind of on a whim just said, like, you guys are salvationists. Like, let's, because Hiram would usually play trombone with the kids. He's like, let's do this on our conical horns. Like, Nathan, grab your alto horn and Mark, bring your cornet. So we played it on cornet, alto horn, and euphonium. It's awesome. It's just like, mm -hmm. man, because you never play chamber music like this. That's you true. never play chamber music on comical instruments. Mm -hmm. And so I, that was like Hiram's idea. And like, I'm like, yeah, this is amazing. <laughs> so Mark yeah. owns a farm out in the half an hour from Asbury. And when he retires from the, like he grew up, his dad was a farmer and he wants to farm. So like when he was not playing in Chicago, he's down here working on his farm. Nice. So he was building a new hay barn. He's like, you guys want to come out tomorrow night? And we'll, can you help me put up roofing on the new hay barn? So Hiram and I went out and we were like, you want to play? He's like, bring your horn, we'll play trios. So we're like, okay. So we just went out and we just like found as many like brass trios as we could find or things to transpose. And we just sat on his porch that night after putting up metal sh sheeting roof, whatever, tin roof, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And we just sat on his horse in front of his horses and his cows and we just played, right? Just for fun. Just because like we're three mm -hmm. friends who just wanted to have fun playing our horns. Yeah. yeah. Sounds and like I a good I think this time. is like, yes, like we need to do more of this. Yeah. And so I'm like, sit, like and we're sitting there and they're like, and so Hiram's like, Next summer, we're doing the, let's do the Ewalds. Like, we'll just do the Ewalds because they're written for this. And like, uh, there's a really great, our trumpet teacher here is a great cornet player as well, Jeff Barrington. He played in the New York Staff Band, as principal of the Trump of the Salvation Army Southern Territorial Staff Band. It's awesome. Nice. It's really great. It's like, oh, we'll just have Jeff play with us and we'll get a tuba player. You know, we have a tuba, you know, our tuba teacher, whatever. Mm -hmm. And Mark's like, oh, I bet Chris Martin would want to come down. They're like, <laughs> yeah. and so like we we're like, nah, that's not real. And so uh, anyway, the Great American Brass Band Festival would happen around here. So I just gave him a call. I'm like, hey, if I could get a group to do this, would you all have us? It's like, sure, yeah, of course they'd have us. I'm like, yeah, Mark right now. So then we then Chris texted back. He's like, I'm in. Turns out his sister in law uh, lives in Danville, Kentucky, where the Great American Brass Band Festival is. He's like, I'd love to come down. I could do that. Nice. So it's just like this weird random thing just happened. And then we, you know, at that point, then we could pick any tuba player we wanted. <laughs> All of a sudden, you have these like amazing, like two of the best orchestral trumpet players in the world, plus Hiram, who's amazing, and then like we, like the only alto horn player. So it worked out. So we we called ourselves the American Conical Ensemble. We couldn't come up with a name, and we just played the Ewald Sextets. We brought in Matt Harding from the Marine Band, the principal cornet of the Marine Band, and he did the Bame Sextet with us. Mm -hmm. And as we were doing it, everyone was just like let's keep doing this like it's awesome and like just the yeah. quality of the player is great but it's just fun and when we do things it's, it's awesome because it's just in the, like the truest sense of amateurism right mm -hmm. it's just people yeah. that love yeah. to do it and it's like we'll work out all the money later let's just find a time to get together <laughs> and play and like let's yeah. play some stuff that's written for us let's like start you know commissioning new works so we have you know, COVID's the worst. So like we had a, a number of things that were going to happen that didn't happen. So we have Bruce Broughton's written us a new new quintet, which is great. We have some music from Florence Price that Dave Miller's arranged for us. Like we have like a whole bunch of new things because people should be like playing in a conical ensemble is so easy, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah, It's like, yeah, it just all makes sense. And when you play the Ewalds, I mean, I think y'all have mentioned you, in the, I think you're aware of the album. I mean, it's yeah. the trade-off between the horn and the euphonium as things just move up from the tuba. It's like, yeah, these pieces make so much more sense. And as we were going through the editing process, just people would be like, I've never, like, we always play these pieces, but I never loved them. And just like mm -hmm. the sound engineers, people like, I never thought these were our masterworks until like 
hearing them in this context, it's like, oh yeah, like that, that's awesome. That's the way well, it's supposed to be. Why do you think yeah. conical ensembles never picked up as kind of like a, a chamber ensemble or even like within like colleges? Like, why do you think conical ensembles aren't a thing? Because ev everyone looks down on band. Because we take band oh, as a pejorative that, guess, word. That, that's the answer that I guess we all knew, but we yeah. wasn't going to yeah. say out loud. But yeah, yeah it's right. like I have a friend who I won't mention who's like of reasonable prominence. He's not someone in the hybrid brass. I'm not like anyway. He calls uh, calls you know, wind band conductor. Somebody just calls them turtleneckers. <laughs> you know, the kind of people that wear turtlenecks with suit jackets. And yeah. mm -hmm. um, there's like this sense, like you know, so I'm going to throw now. I'm going to throw all my American friends under the under the bus. Everyone's going to hate me here. So. <laughs> Like there's some really awesome parts. The American, like the, to me, the coolest part of the American brass band tradition is like you have like these units that are unique in themselves. Like and they're trading parts and there's things that are shared, but they're making arrangements for their own band. So you can find some of them that have, just have amazing alto horn parts mm -hmm. because they had a good alto horn player and they're yeah, yeah, and they're navigating music of society for the public, and it's cool and it's unique and it's individual. And the early like wind band tradition was kind of this way too. And I always forget his name. Uh, the guy at um, Illinois early on, they would do these giant arrangements, but they'd be really they'd have this, he'd have his own distinct instrumentation. But eventually, like the college, the CBDNA, like everything starts to become like super formalized. Like it has to be like this, and then you get the folks like uh, who are awesome in all their own rights. And I won't say any names. Um, who are all dead, but I still don't say their names so I, people don't get too mad at me, who start hating the idea of band. They want to remove it the furthest thing from bands. Like bands are supposed to be outside. They're supposed to be playing on your porch or on the bandstand. They're brass instruments. They're wind instruments, yeah. right? Yeah. Louis XIV called us music of the royal stable. Like we are outside musicians. Like yeah. it's where it makes the most sense. It's where people want to hear you, right? You don't ever have trouble getting people to your outside concerts in the park or on the street corner. Yeah, for sure. Right? Definitely. But they don't want to be that. They want to be the wind symphony, right? And we want to be taken seriously. And we see the sort of the elites of the orchestra and we want to seem like we're orchestra musicians. And so we have like how many pieces that are off, some of them really awesome, like, that are 15 to 20 minutes long. They're all trying to be symphonies or trying to do this thing. Mm -hmm. And like, what's wrong with a band? Yeah, what's yeah. wrong with being a band? What's wrong with playing a band instrument, right? Yeah, the cornet's definitely. super important, but nobody wants to call themselves a cornet player. Yeah. Even though like in band music, you know, the cornet part's the cool one. <laughs> right we've got this like long history of american cornet soloists but it's like we were like oh, I, really the, I don't want to be this band musician so it's like the, yeah. i think the connection to band instruments also the absence of the alto horn you can't have a conical right. ensemble if you don't have that nobody wants to play it like as a horn player i mean it's so hard for horn players to kind of switch back and forth like it's a really different and mm -hmm. like horn players often hate playing the alto horn yeah and they do it on a converter and it's like often they end up sounding like just a bad horn. It's like, just play your horn. You can sound yeah. on a bad, like a bad alto horn. Just play the horn. Yeah, um, yeah. So like, you don't, you don't have that. Like the importance of the trombone and the orchestral repertoire, like how every college wants to be like an orchestral preparatory institute, even though there's like four colleges that are putting people actually into orchestras. Yeah, right. True. So like we treat <laughs> yeah. this, I direct the orchestra too here at Asbury. I mean, I love orchestra. Not yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> but I mean, there's some real ethical issues in higher ed about how we're treating uh, what we're putting students towards and what we're expecting them to do. But you know, there's a ton of music for, you know what people do everywhere. And like what's really thriving are brass bands. Right. And even yeah, like yeah. town wind bands, but I mean, brass bands are just flying. Like there's brass bands yeah, being cool. started all over the place. Yeah, and like, what's yeah. the point? And like, we want to have this, like we all begrudge, like there you have these European systems which are built on long centuries, long traditions of music connected to the state. And that's not our traditions mm -hmm. here in America. Professional music has been about education. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't know, I'm just a big believer in amateurism and like restoring that. And that's one of the great things about the brass band tradition is you have a fleet of amateur musicians who do it because they love it. And it's like, well, that's get, the 19th century brass band. Like, I guess yeah, the, the more, uh, the more colleges that are, you know, preparing students for that upper level job that only five positions exist for, I guess that's uh, that's throwing a lot more college music majors into the amateur market, though, which I guess is a good thing. Yeah, or like, but again, like we have this long tradition of music and education. Like the first American professional musicians were singing school teachers, and you know, in the 18th century, like church movement, like you know, like let's sing better. And then like we have like Lowell Mason, the public music education, and like. That's been the history of American professional music. I mean, in 1950, the personnel manager of the New York Philharmonic said explicitly, this is not a full-time job. So this idea of like the professional orchestra as a full-time <clears throat> job is brand new in history. 
and is yeah. leaving or mm -hmm. is like going to leave like the scales that it kind of moved to in the seventies and eighties where like towns are starting, you know, paying people, but are, like, there's just this elitism about it and that the Academy that I think mm -hmm. just keeps us from doing that. And then we didn't have like the rep, even though it's the sort of the foundation of the brass quintet repertoire, it doesn't make a ton of sense. Like the reason why the Ewald sound awesome on comical ensembles is because they are written for them. True. But like to yeah. go and play like the best rep of the brass quintet on conical ensembles, like doesn't make a ton of sense either. It's like, no, it's like when you listen to those Ewald quintets, like, you know, so the, the euphonium is big and broad, even though he intended it for a baritone, but it's like warm and it's sailing. And the alto horn mm -hmm. is more precise and like pointed in t timbre, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas mm -hmm. with the quintet, like the horn is, has a wider sound and the trombone is more precise. So you have these trombones playing these like lyrical soaring lines and you have the French horn playing like these precise rhythmic lines. It's like, it just sounds better mm -hmm. when that's inverted with textures. Yeah. yeah so definitely. we're sure. hoping like, so that's one thing we want to do is hybrid brass, start commissioning work and getting people writing these works. Like in England, there's not the the, the, the chamber music tradition because it's so hyper band. You have the quartet, mm -hmm. and there's some really awesome quartets, but they're just like a quintet's better acoustically, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because in those quartets, the euphonium is just not exploited, mm -hmm. right? For sure. Like there are moments where it is, but then you lose the depth of the bass voice, and so mm -hmm. like yeah so no one's really done that thing much so if we can if we can create a movement where people are playing conical brass instruments and some chamber ensembles like that would make me very happy yeah so well, especially with high bridge oh sorry steven go ahead. no i was gonna say i for one obviously being a euphonium player super biased but i'm all for that <laughs> like let's do yeah it. like think about how many good euphonium players there are in the world yeah like which, I mean, so for you you guys who are like serious euphonium players, it's, it it stinks, right? It's like, oh yeah. It's and like, there's something, I mean, I think the euphonium <laughs> is the perfect brass instrument as far as like you have to use air, like it's agile, it's fast, it's beautiful. Like you can play the entire range of the human voice. Mm -hmm. Like the alto horn, like we like, I have no fourth valve. I can't, like I'm very, like there's a limited range. Mm -hmm. Euphonium can play through it all. It's like, you don't have to have an embouchure because you, like the corners of your lips are your embouchure, right? Like playing like stupid horn, you're, like you go work so hard and setting in your embouchure and doing these things. How many euphonium players? Yeah, yeah. How many euphonium players you know like, have real lip issues? Like not a ton. It's not that's not yeah. there, but it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for, sure, for sure. Think about my horn friends. Like I mean, the amount of times I just shattered my lip or did something to my lip as a horn player. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Do you see like hybrid brass and if there's an evolution of more of these types of ensembles forming? Do you see that as uh, a continuation or the evolution of? a group like Saxton's like the modern form of that type of early American brass band, or is it its own thing? I do. So there's a handful of projects we have that we want to do in the future that kind of connect more to the early American brass band movement. We want to do an album. We've kind of like made some st headways towards this, but again, COVID stops everything with like, like really world-class singers singing with a, like arias and songs um, mm -hmm. with a conical brass quintet accompaniment. Nice. It's ideal for so this is like Ginny Lind, like this, like yeah, you know, exactly. You know, so to redo that, so groups like Saxton's, you know, almost all the brass bands had like small arrangements and big band arrangements, mm -hmm. um, and so they kind of did that. It wasn't it wasn't necessarily like they are trying to be a quintet, um, but I like to see hybrid. So what I like to see it as, I think we all kind of like to see it as some varied things, but there's a similar path is that it's like we play music that's lyrical and has melodies and like can be progressive and push the limits but the great thing with the ewalds is they're built on folk tunes true and ewald wrote those for his buddies to play like he didn't write those because there was a market for them or it was this genre that existed it's like he played i think he played the tuba in the group but he had buddies who played conical instruments and he's like let's write music for our friends to play and i think that's like the truest expression of high bridge brass is even though there's these professional world-class musicians like we just are want to play with our friends yeah yeah. Like, and like we all like we don't have to worry like we're not trying to make it as a quintet like we can't tour we mm. can't do all of the things that you do as your quintet and frankly none of, we don't have the time for it it's so mm. like for us it's like what are the most fun things we can do like so we played in new york last year when uh the chicago symphony was playing at carnegie so like okay mark and chris are together so we went and we like practiced some played some new pieces and then performed at montclair state on the like those guys are unreal like their faces i don't know how they do it so we played a full <laughs> hour and a half quintet concert 
like where Chris played Carnival of Venice. And then he went and did a, a New York Phil gig that night. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> That's like Mark's like, oh, I'm off to, you know, we're playing in Chicago, playing in Carnegie. So like they like played this yeah. quintet gig with us. I'm like, after a quintet gig, I'm done. <laughs> I'm like, that's yeah, it for yeah. the day. Yeah, and those guys are just like, they play, they don't ever stop. Like I've never played in a quintet where the trumpet players don't like ask for a break at some point. We, they, mm-hmm. There's no, like, they're just like, they just, it's just like only musical considerations. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So unreal. Yeah. <laughs> How do you see your involvement with Saxton's kind of having, helping to form your uh, approach to either playing on like modern brass instruments <clears throat> or approach to uh, <clears throat> how you viewed the Salvation music or or hybrids brass? So a ton of ways. I love Saxton's cornet band. Like, I love it because uh is for the same reasons like it's just a group of friends that play but they're really good and like we hold ourselves to high standards so when i moved back to town and i'm like just like the sort of french horn gigs i thought i would get weren't there Mm -hmm. it's like the best thing i played in was saxton's and it was on hard instruments like playing on crummy instruments and going all right but let's sound good and let's play in tune Mm -hmm. and let's like listen to endings and let's phrase and let's like play real music and it opened up like i wasn't uh, aware of all the opera music and just like the depth of the repertoire. Mm-hmm. And for me, it gave me a picture of what early Salvation Army brass bands in America sounded like. This is what people had in their mind. And this is the repertoire that they had to go on. And these were, I mean, a lot of these people in the early Salvation Army bands, like, they weren't just new converts. Like, there's a guy, Ed Trumpeter Trumbull, was a cornet player for a brass band in Elmira, Ohio, or something like this. Mm-hmm. And they come out of these, these, these traditions where they played in the Civil War. So like that was like helpful for me as I started being interested in research. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just like, good for me as a musician like just the, the that challenge like just like every, you always need a challenge you need something that's making you go like well that's hard like this yeah, instrument yeah, doesn't definitely. play in tune at all yeah but yeah, like yeah i mean so many they of those it, they made it work in the time right <laughs> yeah like the, the thought like and then i think i had this thought and other people had this thought. i was like well they just were out of tune it's like no they, like look at the music they're playing like they didn't play you know the fourth duetto from trovatore and go like yeah it's just out of tune it's okay yeah <laughs> like they weren't seeking that out and doing that like they're like oh let's yeah. let's make this sound good and like yeah yeah so like that that was that was awesome like i love that experience like i love the challenge and then also like um like i really i wish like i i'm on the board of sexes i'm constantly pushing like let's do modern things let's like mm-hmm. recreate like let's do saxons let's play these horns wear silly outfits you know play on these old mouthpieces but like, let's do a Lady Gaga. Like, mm-hmm. let's do this thing where we mediate culture. Like, it's and sort of like a spoiler post-modern. alert. That's that's how I'm ending my uh, lecture recital. Is I'm oh! ending, but not with Lady Gaga, with like a oh. pop song. Like, yeah, I'm gonna no. I'm gonna end it like exactly what you just said, and awesome. kind of go through it all yeah. and end with like, and this is possible too, kind of thing. Yeah, and so like, I see Hybrid is kind of like inheriting that sort of tradition. But like we're not necessarily doing it with like pop songs, but with like with folk melodies and art. Mm-hmm. Like Mark's really Mark is just like really thinks outside the box and is just has this real clarity about a lot of things um, that I love. But as, as we think about what we're playing, he's like, what we are is like we're not nozzle brass or Canadian brass. Like we're not going to stand up and memorize music and put on a show. Like yeah. we're the quintet that sits down and plays a fifteen minute piece and hold you hold your attention like Mm -hmm. and so we're kind of like navigating that space like between melody and folk and art Mm -hmm. which is like this is an awesome thing about brass musicians even in orchestras like if you think about americans like people playing in orchestral brass sections in america are working class kids who learned how to play the trumpet in the trombone in their middle school band and like they went to like a state school or like mm-hmm. a small like liberal arts school mm-hmm. like that's generally like that's often the story it's like these were you know chris martin's parents are music educators like mark's parents are farmers my parents are pastors like hiram's dad you know parents Im- you know grandparents immigrated from cuba chris tiedman's parents are music educators in the northwest it's like we're all working class kids yeah mm-hmm. like who grew up in you know neighborhoods and learned how to play and like that's that sounds real similar to me to the early American brass band and the makeup of those groups yeah, and the makeup yeah, of Salvation yeah. Army brand bands. It's like, and I just don't want us like, I'm just, I'm, let's quit 
be trying to be something else. Let's quit trying to be British brass bands. Let's quit throwing on our turtlenecks and trying to not say band. Like we've got this mm -hmm. awesome tradition, right? Yeah, Which is like yeah. art and folk and like music of the people. Right. Like, Definitely. Be that. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't want to uh, suggest in here anyway that I think like America or American traditions are better than other traditions or something. No, 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 for sure. It's yeah. just like we have our own, and like it can <laughs> do other things. Like you certainly, our first album is like Russian music, essentially. Like the Ewalds, Bame mm -hmm. is German, but he's like working in Russia. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just like yeah, I just think it's I, I love it. Yeah. Um, and I, and the, as I've got like Hiram and I've talked about this a lot, like. It's like our worlds are kind of collided on these like conical instruments and brass bands. And it seems to be, a, there seems to be a moment for this. Um, and I just want to be a part of that. You know what I mean? Like, I like the idea. I don't, you know, I don't need to be a star or a hero or a soloist, but like to like be a part of people making music with their friends for fun. Yeah. Like that's sure. what it should be. Like, that's what it's about. Like who cares? Yeah all the other stuff like let's make music with our friends so on that i'm gonna plug some things here so asbury university where i teach i think i think has the longest running college brass band in the country i haven't oh, cool. done the research to from that but we've at the the there's a brass band that's in collaboration with the salvation army and the university um so we've been active since the 1950s nice um uh and we are just well like we're right in the middle of brass band country in america um but we're going to be launching we're launching this year it's, it's first sort of event will be next spring next january uh, but we're launching the brass band institute which is to support and promote brass banding in america nice. so i'll do a, a nice. handful of things and there's some things that have been done and are attempted in the past like in the late 70s early 80s um north carolina state would hold sort of like these academic events where they bring over guys from England and people from the Salvation Army and teach people about brass banding and Yamaha sort of sponsored it and started producing brass band instruments and trying to get into the American market um, for that. So we'll, it, there'll be more information coming out soon, but next January, we're going to be hosting a festival. Um, and it's really, there'll, there'll be like a comp, we don't know exactly how it will function. There'll be a, a competition connected with it, but mostly a, a fun competition and not test pieces. Mm -hmm. Um, but the idea will be like connecting resources to helping bands grow and helping bands flourish and be their best self. So bringing in, so um, High Bridge is going to be a part of that. Um, so we'll be like, sort of like a gala band. There'll be a, an all-American like high school honor band that's associated with that. And then we'll bring in like excellent clinicians on different instruments to work with people. And then eventually it'll lead into sort of like a credentialing program. So you could take like, uh, you can get a credential in brass bands. And you could nice. take conducting or you could take like you could have like a brass band arranging, get a credential in brass band arranging or brass band conducting or bra like brass band performance where you might be able to like, like learn about the repertoire of brass bands. Um, so connect to that and just like really start encouraging that. And then when bands come mm -hmm. in, bands or groups come and participate, like they'll get some like resources that they can use to help grow and develop like high, like high quality multi camera produced productions that they can use online mm -hmm. and different things that we can just like give people resources to do what we want to do better. So kind of just yeah, supplementing yeah, the American awesome. brass band movement. That's fantastic. I'd love it if yeah. they're like early American bands came to this as well. Like it doesn't need to be, we don't need to duplicate and just be like, let's see if we can be a British brass band competition that happens in America. But when is that? That's in January, be 2022. January. So like, I think it's January 24th or something that the last weekend in January, 2021. So we're hopeful, like we're kind of strategically planned by when we think people can be vaccinated and we can do mm. some live performance yeah, definitely. safely. Mm. And then the following years, we'll start launching other components of it. And one of the things I'm most excited about is a big part of it's going to be academic outreach. So it, this is another thing that I'm going to say out loud and you're going to go, of course, we all think this, but no one says it out loud, which is encouraging schools that are small, underfunded or under-resourced to use brass bands. So we're going to working to get like, that's my dissertation. So. Is it really awesome? <laughs> yeah. Well, what we're going to do, we're working with a few instrument makers and working with uh, some grant writers and some grant companies, like to have some like grant templates that people can fill out. Like everything about it makes sense. Like you, you go to these rural schools or these poor schools and it's like, you can't have a concert band. Like mm -hmm. you're going to have like 14 clarinets and bassoons and oboes. <laughs> and like, you're going to yeah, expect yeah. to teach all this and maintain that. Like, Brass instruments are cheaper, they're more durable, they're more affordable. The repertoire exists. 
So mm-hmm. like connecting to some British things, but as well as like Salvation Army has pedagogic material for brass bands that are ready to roll out that people could buy right now. Yeah. So they'll be like, here's a, like, if you were a high school or a middle school band director in an underfunded or smaller school district or a Christian or a private school, like we only have one model for you in America or anyway, it's like, you have to try to do a wind band and you go to a big state school and you go, okay, now I learn how to do these wind bands and I get sent out and you don't have the booster club and you don't have the resources mm-hmm. that you have at these other places. And then you try to do it. It makes more sense for your marching band. Like it yeah, really yeah. blends into this tradition of mm-hmm. like America and like drum corps. It's like m- more suited to that and giving your kids opportunities there. Like you can play real repertoire with 14 or 15 kids. Yeah. Definitely. Right. It's just like, we all, like we've all heard it. You're writing a dissertation about it. It's like, it just mm-hmm. makes the most sense in the world. And not to say that we shouldn't be doing wind bands, like schools that can afford wind yeah, bands. Of course. Doing wind bands. They're awesome. Right. There's no yeah, reason yeah, not totally to do that. Agree. But to expect, like, again, like, I just feel so bad. And I've had them, I've had students that I've had in different places who have gone on and they get sent to this tiny place and they're asked to do this thing. And their only hope is, like, the model is you do really well there, then you get a job at a bigger place and you leave there. And what's the hope <laughs> yeah. for that place? Like, yeah, for sure. Like, we want, what's the point of music education? Like, we want kids, like, to make music because it's, like, good for your brain, it's good for your soul, it's good for your mental health. And, like, it's good for your community. Like you should be making yeah, good music, but instead these small places get relegated to being kind of music. It's like, but the brass band could do that. And so that's one thing we're going to like be trying to promote in some big ways and some big initiatives. Like, and like, that's where these credentialing programs really come into play. So if you're a music educator, you can, you could take this credentialing program and take a brass band leadership, which would connect you to the resources that you didn't learn in college that you don't know that exists, connect you to teachers, and like a support system that can help you do this, connect you to like grant writers and like access to instruments that can help you provide instruments for your schools that are of high quality that your kids can play and be maintained. This is directly through Asbury. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. So it's going to be the brass band Institute at Asbury university. And then this, like we were going to call it the American brass band Institute, but then we thought it just could be confusing some people. That's my pet peeve. I really wanted to be the American brass band Institute, but whatever. Mm. Um, (laughs) It'll go. And then what we can have is like, like, you know, brass bands are springing up all over the country. And roughly from like the, the, the little research we did on just a few anecdotal research from a few bands, like a half to two thirds of the people in those bands are music educators. A lot of them are low yeah. brass players who never found a place in that the mm-hmm. professional wind band. And they're like, they're not jobs in the orchestra for the euphonium player. Like they're yeah. filled with these people who are really good musicians, like and can really yeah. play and they're teaching at schools it's like, hey, you know, you're struggling to think, like, why don't you do this thing that you love and that you're like, mm-hmm. you can do. And like, when we mention it to people, it's like, there's like, you almost see a burden lifted when you mention it to some educators. <laughs> like, what if you could do this? And they're like, yeah, like, I've been thinking that yeah, my whole yeah, life. Definitely. And as I've mentioned this, as we've, as we've been talking to like building a support network and like a group of, you know, advocates, everyone has like, like I've always thought that and I've never said it out loud. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but essentially all of their all of their warnings are like, beware the turtleneckers. They don't say that in those words, but it's like there will yeah, be yeah, some folks, <laughs> right? That are yeah, going yeah, to that, be offended. But yeah, yeah, yeah that that want to make it kind of the the more uppity type of thing as opposed to the the communal. Or that's just like there's some people are so de- mm-hmm. there's some people are so defensive about their wind symphony. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like they're trying to like yeah. do this th- you know do this thing, and it's like it's awesome. Like mm-hmm. another sure. school doing a brass band is not going to, is not going to hurt, hurt you. Yeah, for sure. Right. Of course. Totally oh, yeah. agree. And yeah. my thing with, with my dissertation is that schools that are able to, especially schools that are able to have like Baroque ensembles, it's like, if they're able to have a Baroque ensemble, why can't they have, man, you're singing you know, a song. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, so like, this is like, I'm, I emphasize Baroque music. So at Asbury, like we're a smaller school. We have a smaller program. We have smaller recital and concert spaces. So like we do one big romantic piece with orchestra a year. We're bringing some people like really in, like go to a bigger space. Mm-hmm. That's like, nobody does enough broke music and broke music is awesome for kids because like we play late 19th century orchestral music. It's kind of soul sucking, right? It's like, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta try to make, don't, don't offend Mr. Beethoven, right? Yeah, you know, right. don't, don't like, <laughs> did you play that three F's or four F's? You know, it's like these like, <laughs> minutia in the score and like students feel like i felt like this as a student like i've got to make it just right but mm, baroque yeah. music is like there's this beautiful thing about it which is like your voice matters what dynamic is it 
more dynamic you want it to be. Like nobody's telling you. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's like, for oh, sure. does that sound boring? It's because you're supposed to do your own thing. Like, how are you supposed to do it? How do you want to do it? Right. You know, it's yeah, like some of the yeah, same yeah. reasons that jazz is really good for kids' brains and creativity. Like mm-hmm. sometimes like this like late 19th century tradition, which is the best, like who doesn't love Mahler? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, like it's not, it does not value the performer as creator. It does not value the performer as a creative of having creative agency all yeah, of the just time. A, just a replicator. <laughs> yeah. So like we're emphasizing Baroque orchestra. So I'm working on getting a grant to buy Baroque bows for the orchestra. Oh, Cause like, why wouldn't we do this thing that we can do really well? Yeah, 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 for sure. And like, That's and awesome. not feel bad about not being this other thing. Like, there's yeah. enough people being them. Like, let's be us. So you already plugged, um, you know, the the brass band institute that you guys are are starting. But uh, where can people go? Uh, like, do you guys have a website for that yet? And also, like, where can people go if they are curious about high bridge brass and want to either pick up your album or just learn more about the group? Yeah. So that that. I, w- I mean, that will be launching. The website for that should be launching in the coming weeks. So okay, awesome. cool. go to asbury.edu slash music. Um, you eventually, in a couple of weeks, you can find it yeah. linked there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'll throw out this other plug. If there's people, if there's a young 16, 17-year-old out the horn player listening to this who's just had hope given to them, like, I think I might be the only place in the country you can summon, come and major on alto horn. So if you want to, if there are people that want to major on alto horn and they know, kid, you lead a youth band, you got some really great alto horn player and they just love it, send them here. They can take alto horn awesome. lessons with me and play in a brass great. band and do, we have conical chamber groups, like, you know, formatted like Highbridge that we do on campus. Mm-hmm. So you can do that thing here. Highbridge Brass, you can go to highbridgebrass.com. We stream literally everywhere and there's more content on our YouTube page. It's like anything on the YouTube page is just like from the few live concerts we've done. Uh, we've got some exciting things hopefully coming up. I won't speak out loud mm-hmm. because then somehow it won't happen. Is the way that works. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but in the COVID, just throwing everything off. But yeah, so they can right. check out Hybrid Brass there. Our album, they can buy their our album from our website or from like literally anywhere you can get things. Uh, you can find it. It's awesome. Yeah. Like it's and it is a great album. So definitely go listen to it or buy it if you haven't already. Last plug. Um, so I grew up playing best in sovereign, best in my like. This was like this is the only answer. People playing brass bands think that if you play a, bra- a brass instrument or like a like the same thing, British euphonium players, they all think they have to play the best in sovereign. <laughs> That's certainly like that. You have like the some good Yamahas, but I came upon the Wilson alto horns, and they are in my estimation like just the best alto horns. So I am a Wilson artist with everything I like, have as. Like my for whatever is worth, my alto horn profile got higher with high bridge brass for like, you know, the seven alto horn players that there are in the world. Um, <laughs> uh, both Besson and Wilson asked me to be performing artists. And so I, as I just, I did just, I got I had both horns and I did a blind playing test and sent it to 12 just amazing musicians like Mark and Hiram, Jim Colonel, people I really I trust and admire uh, mm-hmm. as good musicians. And 11 out of 12 people preferred the, the Wilson horn. Like I, mm-hmm. it's just, it's like really great horn. So I'm a, a Wilson artist, play the 2420 TA. Um, which again, they call the alto horn. Um, yeah. so, uh, <laughs> and, they, and they're, there and and they're like, Swiss. So <laughs> it has a, has a, has a, it's a plays in tune. Well, it has a trigger, a uh, main tuning side trigger, which solves some of the problems of the horn. And if you, uh, it's cheaper than the, than the best in prestige. Uh, so I really encourage people who want to get an alto horn. Um, and I also have a, a mouthpiece I designed with picket brass, which has a little bit thinner rim, which I think is pretty agreeable for people that play French horn, play the Wilson alto horn. Yeah. Cool, cool. Well, Dr. Miller, we can't thank you enough for coming onto the show. I know that this is a topic that we wanted to talk about and and share with people for a long time. So we can't thank you enough for taking the time to to share your experiences and and spreading all this awesome information with us and our listeners. So thank you. Yeah, thanks for letting me ramble and get really excited about brass bands. <laughs> Thank you again to Dr. Nathan Miller for coming on to the Early American Brass Band Podcast. Like I said, we've been tr- uh, talking for a few months now, trying to get this discussion to happen regarding uh, Salvation Army Brass Bands in the United States, and we're really excited that we are finally able to align our schedules and get this to happen. And We hope you all enjoyed and learned something about Salvation Army Brass Bands today. Yeah, definitely. We're grateful for uh, for his time and that he... Uh, we were finally able to make it happen and, and have him come on the show. So it was a great time. Uh, again, you can uh, find uh, more 
information about stuff we mentioned in the episode up on the show notes, uh, which is on our website. That's eabbpodcast.com. Uh, if you want to support the show, the best way you can do that is uh, through Patreon or Teespring. Uh, and like we said at the top, we're on all the social media platforms and YouTube, so you can follow us there so you never miss anything that we put out. This episode's featured album is the album that we were referring to a number of times throughout the episode. <laughs> episode? Episode? <laughs> is High Bridge Brass's self-titled album, High Bridge Brass. We will include links to the album uh, in our show notes. And we highly encourage you to check out this album. It's one thing to be talking about the, the monumental breakthrough that this group achieved by just forming a conical brass quintet. It's another thing to actually hear it. So please yep. check out this album, uh, either stream it or purchase it, and prepare to be amazed. Yeah, definitely. Some great playing. Uh, and the repertoire in the album is fantastic as well. So we do hope that you will check it out. Thank you so much for tuning into the show, and we will see you next time.